Welcome to another Total Education Lecture. Hi, I'm Bruce Pattinson. To try and remember these lectures are brought to you by Total Education. Visit our website, totaleducationcentre.com.au for all your educational needs. There you'll find lectures like this one, but an extended version and notes. We hope these will help you with your study and then we can keep doing these videos. Today I'd like to talk about Caliban from Prospero. Uh, sorry, Caliban from The Tempest. And I really like Caliban as a character. I think he's probably the most interesting character in The Tempest, even more so than Prospero, and certainly has a lot to offer and contribute to our study of discovery. And certainly Caliban interacts with all characters in The Tempest, and he's a, an integral part of that. He doesn't have many lines, but he, he gets a lot of time on stage, and I think that's because of his character. The way I'll shape this lecture tonight is to have a look at Caliban the character first of all, then I'll talk specifically about Discovery and how he integrates with Discovery, and some interpretations of Caliban that help us in that understanding of Discovery and how he links in with the other characters. So let's start by looking at Caliban specifically, a little bit about him and a general overview of his um, part in the play. He is the subhuman son of Sycorax, the, the witch. Um, and so he's portrayed instantly as something different, something very evil. Um, when he comes to the island, when Prospero comes to the island, Caliban's forced to be a slave. Um, and, and he comes across as malformed, and later on we'll talk about some of the quotes where we see his, his malformed. Um, for example, we'll do one now, Prospero says he's um, not honoured with a human shape. And you'll find that quote in Act 1, Scene 2, Line 233. He's initially treated well by Prospero, and, and Prospero treats him more like a pet um, in many ways, and, and he's a, a sort of loyal servant until he tries to rape Miranda. And, and we see here that Prospero um, is revolted by his action, and this leads us to think about his humanity and also Caliban's humanity, and that leads us directly into making discoveries about both of them. Caliban's very instinctual and self-centred, and I'll talk in more detail about that after I move through the plot ideas. Prospero rules Caliban through magic and threats, and we see their initial meeting where, where they, you know, they insult each other. This changes a little bit when um, <coughs> Prospero meets Stefano and Trinc sorry, Caliban meets Pros Caliban meets Stefano and Trinculo, and moves across and, and thinks that they might be equal with Prospero and tries a sort of mini revolution I suppose on the island and this doesn't fail out and he finds out later of course and this is the part where most critics say that Caliban finds his humanity and learns a lot when he decides that Stefano at the end isn't a god and he's not even an equal with Prospero and that's um, if you want to go to that section it's in Act 5 Scene 1 lines 292 to 95 and we'll have a look at that maybe in detail later but that's the section where you'll find that and that's an often used quote when people talk about Caliban and, and what he's discovered through the, through the play. Caliban changes significantly um, according to the context of the play, and I want to talk about this a little bit more, because it's an important part of the rubric when we look at discovery. And that, that context is, is very important, because in Shakespeare's time, for example, Caliban would have been seen as a novelty, a cruelty, a monster in many ways, and Trinculo points this out when he says, oh, we could put you on show and make some money. And one important reading that allows the modern reader to discover something about um, the world is, is the analysis that the post-colonial critics have placed upon Caliban. And in, in this interpretation, it's very important. It, he, he's seen as a third world or developing nation inhabitant, as imagined by Europeans to justify their colonialism. And if you look at the rubric very carefully, context is very important, and it does mention those sorts of things. And you might want to think about that and, and what we discover from our readings and watchings in the play. That's why he's seen in the play, and, and this is what critics suggest, that he's seen as a um, primitive, degenerated figure who is lustful and greedy. And there's plenty of examples of those that you'll know yourselves. Um, more, more readings indicate he's an implacable spirit, and there's, there's of course, in different interpretations. And, and interpretations of that postmodern say he's 
he, he is never subjugated totally because he has that implacable spirit that he wants to be free all the time. And that, that comes in line with the theme we talked about with Prospero in our last lecture about the idea of freedom and that concept of freedom. Um, he never is truly subjugated by that greater power of Prospero. And, and you know, critics align um, Caliban very clearly with the, the native tribes of, of colonial, um, the subjugated by colonial powers. Um, he's, he's Montaigne's noble savage to some critics, that, that savage that, that mightn't be as civilised perhaps as other people on the island, but has that indomitable spirit, that wonderful spirit that can never be taken away. And that's, that's integral to his development and movement towards humanity. I think Caliban's interesting because while he's considered a savage, he certainly is a, a complex character and he's not very much a, a one-dimensional character. He's very much a three-dimensional character and he does adapt and change throughout the play. And we see that in his language. His interactions with all our characters are, are deeply essential to the plot. And while I said last time that Prospero drives the plot, Caliban's also integral and, and certainly has his own lines of, of plot that help make this a, a very complex and complete play. I also mentioned last time about Prospero's anger and how that anger has to change and adapt to get his humanity and many critics have suggested that Caliban is, is the alter ego of Prospero in many ways. He's the angry side of Prospero and there's no doubt that Caliban is angry and he does have things to be angry about. He's a very instinctual creature um, and, and doesn't use logic most times, although we see him later become more manipulative as he, as he learns to be civilised, so to speak. This leads us to think about the interpretation that Caliban is, um, is that human nature, is that part of human nature that we've learned to, to hide or to suppress and keep back that instinctual way of just instantly responding and reacting rather than keeping our feelings and our emotions secret. And Caliban certainly does react. Caliban is a servant, and, and we, we understand this because the language he's been taught is mixed with his own separates him again, and he's got a very different style of language. If, if language represents power, then Caliban is not equal. One example is when he communicates in, um, in, in insults, basically. Um, Miranda calls his language gabble. And, and this leads to him to communicate in his, and we learn later that Prospero has taught him elements of that language so they can communicate. But he's, he's able to communicate sometimes in, in wonderful, very floral and, and complete language, as we see in Act 3, Scene 2, in that speech that he makes there. And that's an excellent example of his um, complexity. And this is, shows that he has and develops the ability to think and speak intelligently as he moves through the play. And that's one thing that he discovers through this, this progressive evolution of his character. Another discovery that we can talk about Cal Caliban that we need to explore and understand is the link between Caliban and nature and how these interact with the civilised world. I think the Tempest allows the audience to discover how a natural man, and that's what he's called in the play, such as Caliban fits into a hierarchical and patriarchal society. And we look in the, in the um, rubric and we see the words context there quite clearly and, and talking about those sorts of things and how those influences are there. Um, and we need to decide for ourselves, does Caliban have the ability to move across all the elements in the play because he isn't in society? Um, he certainly discovers much through his interactions with all the different characters and one of these things is humanity perhaps, although I'm undecided about that. And this speech in... Um, Act 5, scene 1, lines 298 to 301, shows, shows how much he's discovered. And you can go to that quote specifically and use those lines to, to show that. We can't, I don't think, say he finds his complete humanity. Um, and that's just my personal perspective. I don't think he, he discovers and goes, he obviously can't go back into a civilised world as Prospero does. Um, and, and he's not clearly defined as a character at the conclusion. We see him in that speech learn a lot, but I'm not quite sure that he's ready for society yet, mostly mostly because of his physical appearance. He is to live on the island, and again, not just as a savage, but not civilised either. He's a bit of a cross between the two, and I think it's a developmental stage that Shakespeare's pointing out. It's because of this complexity he's been considered the most interesting character in the play. Now, 
that's a general overview and I'd like to try and expand on, on some of those ideas and, and look deeper at some of the discoveries we can make as an audience about him. And, and it starts off, and as I said, he's seen as a savage and, and something not to be admired at all through the plays called Hag Born, Whelp, Demi Devil, Poor Credulous Monster, Hag Seed and Strange Fish. He's um, also referred to in terms of darkness and, and Prospero says this thing of darkness is often compared to, to the earth and, he, and he's the opposite of Miranda who, who's always portrayed as um, white and, and Miranda says he's of a vile race. So it's clearly established right at the very beginning that he's um, not one of them so to speak and, and later on we discover all the reasons why. So then why do we have some sympathy for him as a character? It's not just his speech on the island's music, and that's um, Act 3, Scene 2, Lines 1, 2, 7 to 33. Nor is it his dreams of freedom, perhaps, or his treatment by Prospero. It's a combination of these and, and his interactions with all the characters, especially Trinculo and Stefano. Compared to these two supposedly civilised characters, Caliban comes across to the audience as positively decent, despite his manipulations. And with these two, Caliban shows the superiority of natural capacity over greater knowledge and folly. And those two characters are clearly linked in that way. I'd just like to read you an excerpt now from um, an article by Zanetta Angelieri in William, on William Shakespeare's The Tempest. And she looks clearly at you know, and, and it's a research paper. The quote is, Caliban's appearance is particularly important because his character generates an initial reaction from the audience based on his physical appearance. This audience reaction demonstrates the prejudices against those who are not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, who have existed for centuries, which have existed for centuries. Initially, it is easy to form a dislike of Caliban based on his repulsive appearance, but as his character begins to unfold, we see that there is more to him than just an unattractive exterior. And I think that's a very good summation of what we discover about Caliban on the way through as we read The Tempest, that he's not just that superficial physical appearance. As I've said previously, initially Prospero is sort of kind to Caliban, um, but the wild animal can't be tamed by petting. Nature's about instinct and Caliban really is all about nature. Um, when we discuss Caliban and we, we look at him in terms of discovery, he doesn't quite meet the standards of civilization that allows him to go back to Milan, but yet again he rises above that noble savagery. Caliban always remains in many ways instinctual um, and, he's, and his animalism is always just beneath the surface. He's Wilson Knight, who I talked about before, the famous Shakespearean critic in Crown of Life, says that Caliban has moved from black magic through nature and man to grace. So Wilson Knight does see that he reaches his sense of humanity, and that's on page 239 in the Crown of Life. And if you can download, as I said previously, that book for free from the internet because it's public domain, and there's six or seven pages on Caliban which are very clear and very well developed. Well worth looking at and certainly helpful to your studies. I won't read you the section tonight on Crown of Life, but that little short quote will give you the basic knowledge of the argument that he makes. And if, you, if you're going to look at Caliban as a character, you really need to examine that section of Wilson Knight's book. And that's on page 240 or so of that text. And I'd just like to finish up tonight by reminding you that, you know, we see Caliban as a, as a savage slave but he, he evolves through different stages. At one point, he's, he, he's an angry person, then he's a revolutionary, and then he, he discovers things about man, and, and then he moves into that period, as, as Wilson Knight says, of grace, although I don't think quite agree with that. He's, he, he represents something for Shakespeare that helps us discover on stage what humanity truly is, and he binds the play and gives it a little bit of theatricality and stageness with his looks and if you look at some of the pictures it's, it's wise to get online to Google Images and have a look at some of the portrayals of Caliban over the centuries and you'll see that he's been very difficult to portray and there's lots of different interpretations of Caliban and that's what makes him such a complex character so easy to discover. 
Well, thank you for listening to our lecture tonight. I hope this has assisted you in some way. Don't forget to visit our website, totaleducationcenter.com.au, for all your educational needs. Thank you for listening. Good night.